Before we get to the, the main point of what we're looking at this morning, which will be sort of, um, well, specifically chapter 3, verse 30, which I was encouraged to hear someone read in their quiet time this morning. I just want to, uh, before we get there, I just want to, j- just to make a mini little point before we get on to the main point of the sermon. The first thing I want you to notice this morning is the timing of the events uh, in this passage and so far in John's Gospel. John is quite careful to record the order in which things happen. It's strange that the word synoptic gospels is described is used to describe all the other three gospels, when actually John is really careful to describe the synopsis, the order of events. So I think it's actually quite ironic. I think John, in many ways, is more synoptic than the, those so-called synoptics, but that's a bit by the way. The point is this. Uh, the events recounted so far since um, Jesus' own baptism, which took place in chapter 1, verses 31 to 33, the events since then, up to this point, take place in a period that is not mentioned by any of the other three gospel writers. The other three gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, once they have recounted Jesus' baptism and temptation, they jump straight to what happens after John the Baptist is arrested and put in prison. So just look at one, for example. Um, keep your finger in John 3, but just go back to uh, Mark chapter 1. Verse 14, so on page 836. So you can see the baptism of Jesus is in, verses, uh, is in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Then the temptation of Jesus immediately, verse 12 to 13. And then after John was arrested, it says in verse 14, and so it continues. Whereas our passage is about, well, our passage is even before uh, John is arrested, and and all the bits that come before uh, our passage are are the case as well. Now keep your finger in Mark 1, because we will be flicking that there as well, but go back to to John chapter 3. I just want to just draw your attention briefly at the start of the sermon to how the early events of John chapters 2 and 3 take place before the baptism of John. Uh, Sorry, sorry, before, let me get this right. (laughs) They take place uh, before the arrest of John, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, before the arrest of John and put in prison. Now just think what that means. What has Jesus taught so far? Jesus has taught, chapter 3, early chapter 3, the need for new birth. He taught that to Nicodemus. You must be born again. Unless you're born again, you will not enter or see the kingdom of God. What else has Jesus taught? Jesus taught about himself being lifted up like the bronze snake in Numbers. That bronze snake that Moses made so that everyone who looked to the bronze snake, all the sinners who'd been blaspheming God's name and, and, and uh, saying dreadful things, sinning in other words, everyone had been doing that and who had been bitten by these fiery snakes who looked to that bronze snake was saved and lived and did not die. So Jesus has been teaching about his own crucifixion in these early chapters before the arrest of John the Baptist. Now why is this important? I think it's important for this reason. You sometimes hear people say, how these sorts of things, new birth, um, the atoning work of Christ on the cross, that sort of thing. You will sometimes hear people say that these are late additions to Christianity, that they came really late in the day. You know, the apostles brought them later and then they sort of built up over time. But no, the point is, I'm making it the start here, no, these things were in the message of Jesus from the very start, even before the public ministry began, as regarded as the public ministry by the other three gospel writers. They didn't even think this was his public ministry, and yet Jesus is already teaching about new birth, the atoning work of the cross. Now, of course, the new birth and the atoning work of Christ were were foretold way back in the Old Testament, all sorts of places. But in terms of Christ's own teaching, when he came into the world, these things are there from the very start. So don't let people hoodwink you. You may do some evangelism and people will say, oh, well, Paul taught a different message from Jesus. Don't believe it at all. Absolute nonsense. No. Don't let people play off Paul against Jesus. All these things that, that were are the, the central things of our faith, the central things of, of the gospel are there in Jesus' own teaching from the very start of his ministry. Now, okay, that's that bit aside. Let's look then at the main focus of our passage which is about the rise of Christ and John the Baptist's joy that this was happening, that Christ was was coming to the fore and ascending, though it meant the lessening of John's own position. 
So back in John chapter 3, uh, we see that John the Baptist has been baptizing. And, uh, and in actual fact, John had been baptizing uh, before, uh, before Jesus was baptized, uh, before Jesus starts baptizing, as he does in this passage. So just go back then to Mark chapter 1 again. I've lost my place, but hopefully you've kept it. Page 836. And just see this in verses 4 and 5 about John's own ministry of baptizing. Mark chapter 1, verse 4, John appeared, that's John the Baptist, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. So see, do you see how it says all Judea and all Jerusalem are going out to John to be baptized? What do we see in our passage well, we see at a later date than this, John is still baptizing. But here we see that Jesus is also baptizing. Uh, though in actual fact, if we look on to chapter 4, verse 2, we find that Jesus himself did not actually baptize people. His disciples did. But the point is, you have John and his disciples over here somewhere baptizing. And then Jesus starts doing the same thing over here. We don't know exactly how far away these two places are, but in two separate places, Jesus starts doing through his disciples, the sorts of things that John had been doing for some time. And verse 26, chapter 3, John 3, verse 26, it's brought to Jesus's, sorry, brought to John's attention by one of his own loyal disciples. What does it say? Verse 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan. He can't even bring himself to name Jesus. He's so cross about this, this, this disciple of John. He who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness. Look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. So John had built up this substantial following through his baptizing ministry. All Judea, all Jerusalem are going out to him. Now, surely that doesn't mean every single person, but a, a lot of people are going out to John, being baptized, confessing their sins. And maybe becoming followers of him. But all that substantial following that John has built up is now hemorrhaging. As people are leaving, John in droves to follow Jesus. In modern terms, they were unsubscribing from John's channel and starting to follow Jesus' instead. John's ratings were being decimated. How easy it would have been for John to see this as a threat as competition, someone treading on his toes, his patch. But what we see in this passage is that John has his heart so right in all that's going on here. And this is what we're to learn from. Because John, now in our passage, lives up to this message that he's preached earlier in John's Gospel. From the very start of John's ministry, John has preached, he's pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God! John's whole commission from God was to bear witness about the light coming into the world, chapter 1, verses uh, 3 to 4. And he did. Uh, sorry, I gave you the wrong... Uh, verses 6 to 8, sorry, chapter 1. And John does, he, he bears witness to the light. He testifies about Jesus. Chapter 1, verse 34, he says, this is the Son of God. He point, points to Jesus' vast superiority to him. John chapter 1, verse 30. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. He existed before me. John is older than Jesus, but John says Jesus existed before him. And John testifies in chapter 1 verse 27 of his own unworthiness before Jesus. I, verse 26, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now it's possible to do all that John did, to point to Jesus, to say, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's greater than I. I'm not worthy to, to untie his shoelace. It's possible to preach Christ and gain followers. I know that because our YouTube subscribers have been going up. This is quite relevant. Not, not dramatically, but little by little. It's possible to preach Christ and your ratings go up. 
But John does the opposite. He's preaching Christ and his ratings go down. People leave him in droves because of his faithful preaching. John was now losing followers to Jesus. And this is the point of the passage. He was happy that this was so. He rejoiced that this was the case. His indignant disciple, John's own indignant disciple, who comes to him and won't even mention Jesus' name. He's so livid about it. John just says, calm down. I'm glad. I'm glad that this is happening. So John is actually a great model for all that preach the Lord Jesus. John humbly lived his message. John is like Psalm 115 verse 1 that says, Not to us, O Lord, not not to us, but to your name give glory. John is like Paul in Philippians chapter 1 verse 20 where Paul says, It is my eager expectation and hope that Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. John is like the 24 elders in Revelation chapter 4 who are crowned and seated around God's glorious throne. And yet, what do they do with their their thrones and their crowns? They come off their thrones. They again and again fall down before God and they cast their crowns before the throne of God. There are others we could compare John to in the scriptures. There's that amazing passage in 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 4. Jonathan, who's the heir to Israel's throne, But he knows that the Lord's anointed is David, and he gladly strips himself of all his royal accoutrements, his sword, his armor, and he hands it to David as though to say, yours is the kingdom. And so John regards Jesus' rise, Jesus' ascendancy, Jesus' increase, and his own corresponding receding from prominence with unfeigned joy and worship and adoration. And here's the key verse, verse 30. He must increase, says John. He, Christ, must increase. I must decrease. Now, how much everyone that serves Christ, in whatever way, needs to have this in mind? Turn back with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, verse 11. Jesus here is speaking about John the Baptist, and he says this, Truly I say to you, this is on page 816, by the way, 816, Matthew 11, 11. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So John, in his role as forerunner to the promised one, the Messiah, John, in his role as, as, as Christ's forerunner, was as great as Christ's servants become. There's no one greater among those born of women, says Jesus, in John's role uh, of being the forerunner to the Messiah. And yet, even in that great role that John was privileged to have, John was less than the least of the saved people of Christ. Now, it's not that John wasn't among the redeemed himself. That's not the point here. No. But as regards John's own great role of being forerunner to Christ, that particular prophetic mantle that he wore, John was less than the least in the kingdom. And so pastors are less than the least of all those inheriting eternal life. Elders, deacons, likewise, as regards their office of elder and deacon, less than the least. Your favorite preachers online, whoever they might be, they're less than the least of those in the kingdom of God. George Whitfield uh, lived at a time of amazing uh, spiritual blessing in this country in the uh, 18th century. And there were times in his life when there were disagreements with others, for example, the Wesleys, over certain doctrinal points. And there were those who were, as it were, disciples of George Whitfield, a bit like John the, John the Baptist's own disciples, who wanted George Whitfield to fight for his own corner, to establish himself against those who stood uh, of, of other theological opinions. 
And what does Whitfield say? A bit like John the Baptist. This is what Whitfield says. Let the name of Whitfield perish. Let my name be forgotten, trodden under the feet of all men, if Jesus may thereby be glorified. I want to bring souls not to a party, that means a partisan party, not a party party, but a, you know, a, a divisive party. I want to bring souls not to a party, but to a sense of their undone condition by nature and to true faith in Jesus Christ. Let Jesus be our all in all. That was a great attitude. George Whitfield lived it out. John the Baptist lived it out. I need to live it out. All who serve Christ need to live it out. And even in order to come to salvation, we need to see ourselves as less than the least. We need to have our eyes open, don't we, that we are sinners. We have nothing to offer God at all. And so we need to keep that attitude. It's so easy for self-importance, even for those who are really Christ's, who are really trusting in Christ. It's so easy for self-importance to come back. And church is split over this, and it happens tragically all the time because people are self-important. And so there's a message Maybe at a time when we're not particularly facing it, but we need to hear it nonetheless. We must decrease. We're nothing. Let the name of bachelor, whatever it is, perish. Let the name of Christ be all in all. That's, in a sense, half of John's message. I must decrease. Let me devote the rest of my time to the other, other half of John's message, the positive bit. He, Christ, must increase. This is what John the Baptist desired, not just for himself to be decreasing, but for Jesus and his name to be lifted up and exalted and his cause and his following to grow and increase. That was John the Baptist's heart, and that's what I want to, to preach now. John here speaks of Jesus as the bridegroom. So back in John chapter 3, page 888, I'm just trying to find a verse, sorry, there it is, verse 29. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom, that's Christ. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So John speaks of Jesus as the bridegroom. That's actually an Old Testament figure that God fulfills, a role that God has, the bridegroom of God's people. So for you who love Christ and are trusting in him for salvation alone, sorry, for, for salvation from your sins, trusting in Christ alone, I want to preach to you this morning. You are the bride. You are the bride of Christ. I want to preach for you your bridegroom and, as it were, big him up. Though I'm not bigging him up at all. I'm just showing you, in a sense, his greatness, his exaltedness. What, is, what does John say here? Well, it's his delight to say that the bridegroom has now come. John describes himself as a friend of the bridegroom. In an ancient um, wedding, a Jewish wedding at this time, there'd be the friend of the bridegroom who's roughly equivalent to the best man. And his role, as you can see from here, his role is to, to listen out for the arrival of the bridegroom. He, he's waiting. And as soon as he hears that the bridegroom is there, he, he announces it and he rejoices and he He's received out of view. He's, he's not going to be the center of attention anymore. He, his role is just to listen out and get out of the way when the bridegroom comes. So that's what John does here. So the point here then is that the, the Lord Jesus Christ, your bridegroom, if you're trusting in him for your sins, the Lord Jesus Christ is your bridegroom and he's come for you. He's come to redeem you, to rescue you. He came from the Father, to use the language of of, of, the, of marriage in Genesis chapter 2 and of Genesis 2. He came from his father to cleave to you, his bride. He loves you. He will always love you. He became flesh for you to save you from perishing in your sin and to give you eternal life. And so do you see in our passage, people are flocking to Jesus. Jesus would not have people baptized unless they were truly coming with a, a real faith. Not like Nicodemus' faith, but a real faith in him. And so people are flocking to Jesus and being baptized. And we see similar things in the, the other Gospels. We see Jesus was popular amongst 
those who are just regarded as beyond the pale sinners, prostitutes, tax collectors, magnetized to Jesus. Why? Because he condoned their sin? No. But he offered them grace and forgiveness and redemption from their sin. And they delighted in this and they were magnetized to Jesus. And that's what's happening in our passage. Sinners magnetizing to Jesus, who has the message of grace. They loved him. But what do we hear John saying? We hear John saying, but Jesus must increase. Jesus must increase from this. Yes. Okay, so take your mind forwards a bit in time to the cross, where the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. And see there Jesus laying down his life for his sheep. See him lifted up as the banner like we thought about a few weeks ago. Lifted up on a cross in agony and humiliation to die so that lost sinners would look to him and believe and not perish under God's wrath that they deserve, you and I deserve for our sin. So see Jesus as we thought this morning from that song, see him bear the wrath, pay the cost at the cross. See the justice of God there, forever satisfied. It is finished, cries Jesus in John 19. So that all who trust in him are washed forever of our sin. We're cleansed. We can stand before God with with not one single blemish of red on us, but purely in the perfect righteousness of Christ. So see the magnitudes of grace and mercy shown to you at the cross. And as John sees that, he goes, yes, amen, but he must increase. And so, yes, of course, we go beyond the cross. The cross on the one hand, especially in John's gospel, is Jesus' glorification, and yet there is glory to come. Because, of course, as Jesus goes to the cross, he is taken down to zero, to nothing. He is stripped of everything. He is there cursed, bearing the curse of our sin. And so he must increase. Physically dead and divinely judged, he is raised by the Father on the third day for the increase of the Son of God. And you're raised with him. Jesus is raised to be our resurrection and life as well. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And that it comes true as he is raised. He's raised for his his flock as well. The first fruits of resurrection. And he comes to his disciples, we see later in John's Gospel. He comes raised from the dead. He he speaks peace to them who've let him down. He reinstates Peter. He gives Peter a role in his kingdom. And he calls his disciples, his weak failing brothers, uh, his weak failing disciples, he calls them his brothers in John chapter 17. So there Jesus is, crucified, resurrected and John looks at this as it were and he says yes but he must increase what do we see then we see the son of God ascending from earth to heaven how does he ascend from earth to heaven he is carried in the clouds of glory the transport reserved for God himself and so Jesus leaves earth carried on the, on the clouds of heaven. He blesses his disciples with arms outstretched as he goes. And we see the scene in Daniel chapter 7 as he arrives in the heavenly courtroom, the heavenly throne room of God. What do, we, what do we see there? He's presented at the heavenly throne. And the Father receives Jesus with these words. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. There we see him increasing And he's given everlasting dominion. All nations, all languages, all peoples become his forever. He receives a kingdom that shall not pass away. All authority in heaven and earth is given to him. He's given the name that's above every name, both that can be given in this age and in the next. He's enthroned at the right hand of God. He is exalted above the heavens, it says in Hebrews. He is their king of kings and lord of lords. And John the Baptist, as it were, stands beside us and watching this and says, yes, amen. And he must increase still further. What happens then? Yes, so Christ then sends his Holy Spirit to subdue the nations, to bring about the repentance of people. 1 Timothy 3, verse 16, we've looked at it recently. He, Jesus is there preached among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. 
and so through the preaching of the gospel. In this present era, Christ is further increased and magnified and exalted and glorified as people are brought sub, uh, are subdued from their rebellion to him and converted and humbly bow and willingly acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. And so in this present era, Christ is being glorified and exalted and increased through the elect being gathered to him over the course of the centuries. Through the outpouring of the Spirit that began at Pentecost, the Father begins a new work of exalting his Son before the eyes of all the nations. And it says in Isaiah, all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. And that is happening across the world as Jesus is being preached and believed on. And John, as it were, stands beside us and says, yes, amen. And he must increase still more. And so the Lord Jesus will come again on the clouds of heaven with his Father's glory, with his angel train with him. And every eye will see him and every tongue will confess. Every tongue, not just those who believe in him, but every tongue will confess him, Lord. Every knee bow before him. And his voice will raise the dead from their graves, both the saved and the non-saved. He will sit on the great judgment throne with all the nations arrayed before him. The living and the dead will be gathered before him. He will call his saved ones to the kingdom and the joy prepared from, for them from the foundation of the world. And those not found clothed in his perfect righteousness through repentance and faith, he will cast into the outer darkness, into the everlasting fire. And so in that final time, he will bring his bride to himself, his church, presented in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or stain or blemish. And we will see him as he is. And we will be like him. And we'll be enraptured by his beauty and captivated by his grace. And he will gather us to his banqueting house and his banner over us will be love. And with joy and gladness, we will enter the palace of the king. And there forever, he will increase in the eyes of his bride as he shows us the glory that the father has eternally given him before the world began and the love of the father with which he's mercifully loved us. He must increase cries John, cries John yes the Lord Jesus Christ must increase of the increase of his government and peace of the increase of his exaltation and glory of the increase of the outshining of his brightness and beauty of the increase of the praise he brings to his father for all the gospel work that he's done in gospel in, in grace and mercy of the increase of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his rising and renown, there will be no end. Amen. Let's pray.